Hey everyone, it is, um, well, it's time for the weekly compilation video, and I know today's uh, Tuesday, so I'm a little bit late getting it up from last week, but you know, life sometimes happens, and no matter how hard we try, it just sometimes it takes a little bit longer to put it up, but anyway, um, we were talking about pudendal neuralgia all last week and pudendal neuropathy, and so um, we're going to put everything together there and, and kind of really dive deeply into that subject. The languages, for those of you that still care, were uh, Tamil um, was on Tuesday, and then um, Urdu was on Wednesday, and uh, then Danish was on Thursday. So yeah, pretty exciting stuff. So anyway, pudendal neuropathy, um, well, let me back up. So I'll probably use the terms neuralgia and neuropathy kind of interchangeably throughout this whole video. Um, basically, what you're talking about is either a pain with the nerve or a disorder of the nerve. Neuralgia, that kind of suffix that algia means pain and and, op, and the pathy, that's where we get like pathos, um, you know, it's kind of like in medical terms, there, there's a kind of a disease or a condition with. So um, just kind of a, you know, whatever, FYI type thing for that. Um, but pudendal neuropathy basically is um, inflammation or irritation of the pudendal nerve. The pudendal nerve is a nerve that comes out of the sacrum, specifically the second, third, and fourth, from the second, third, and fourth kind of sacral uh, nerves. And they kind of join together and form this kind of thicker nerve bundle that goes from your sacrum, kind of in your low, low, low back, kind of all the way down deep through your pelvis and then comes out through what's called Alcox Canal, which is, um, you know, right by kind of the groin. And then it branches up into three divisions, one which goes up to the labia and to the clitoris. The second goes to the perineum or the area between the vulva and the anus. And the third one goes down to the anus itself. Um, and there's a lot of different things that can cause irritation or inflammation of this nerve, as you might imagine. And so when patients have this condition, it's of utmost importance to find out where the issue is. And that way you can really treat the discomfort uh, and the symptoms kind of, you know, correctly. So one of the first things we need to figure out is, okay, well, how does pudendal, you know, neuralgia present? Well, as a general rule, there is going to be some, you know, everything from little itchiness, tingly, all the way to sh like electric shock type burning pain originating kind of on somewhere in the course of that nerve. Um, and this can be kind of exagger or, uh, exacerbated by movement or activity, by sitting for prolonged periods of time, um, sexual activity, you know, whatever it may be can make those kind of that inflammation flare. And so when it occurs, you know, it, it's often, you know, patients will show up and they'll say, sometimes, you know, I just get this sharp shooting pain down by my vulva or down in my pelvis and it kind of comes. And, and then if I, you know, change positions, it will go away. Or once I stop doing that activity, it will go away. So that's the typical presenting thing. Um, now, I, I mentioned this before and I'll say it again, I'm sure in the future, but remember the very kind of earliest sign of nerve irritation is an itch sensation. Um, and so when patients present with chronic vulvar itching, especially if when you do an exam, you don't see any type of skin changes, things like that, they have swabs that come back negative for any type of infection, you always wanna check for that pudendal neuropathy there as that could be the cause for that patient's you know, um, complaint. So, you know, what can cause it? Well, you know, typically, like I said, anything that's impinging on that nerve can cause irritation downstream. In the OBGYN world, we see pudendal neuropathy often happening from pelvic floor dysfunction. And what's one of the most common things that causes pelvic floor dysfunction? Pregnancy and childbirth. So definitely you can have post obstetric or post kind of delivery pudendal neuropathy, um, you know, pelvic floor dysfunction, whether that's hypotonic where it's, the muscles are kind of loose. So other muscles are having to try and squeeze up tightly to hold on to them or hypertonic where the muscles themselves are super duper tense. Each of those can cause nerve issues in their own respective way. You know, if you think about it, if, if I have two nerves kind of like this, or excuse me, two muscles like this, and there's a little nerve tunnel through there, and when they're nice and relaxed, this nerve can move pretty easily, no problem with that. But if those are tensed down, if they're clamped down on that nerve, I can't really move it and you get that nerve zing with, with pain. So, and we see this sometimes in patients, like I said, you know, even outside of pelvic floor dysfunction, if they've had um, operative vaginal deliveries, like a, um, a forceps delivery, something like that can sometimes cause it. Inappropriate 
uh, or incorrect uh, obstetric like delivery lacerations, if those weren't repaired correctly, um, what's called a medial lateral episiotomy. Um, instead of a episiotomy cutting straight down, it goes over kind of to the side, to the angle there. That can sometimes lead to it. Those are really common obstetrical complications. Now, obviously, any type of pelvic surgery can result in pelvic floor issues, so hysterectomies, slings, anything like that, those can all cause it too. And then just chronic pelvic pain conditions. You know, our body has a tendency when it hurts in an area to try and wrap tissue around that, that area. You know, if you think about it, if your chest hurts, we instinctively try and kind of curl up around it. And the same thing in the pelvis. If there's pain there, those muscles will try and spasm and wrap around it, and that can impinge on those nerves too. Obviously, um, you know, if it's difficult or if it's pain or, or discomfort on the entire course of that nerve, you want to look and see is it something maybe a little bit further up in the chain as, as opposed to a specific, you know, branch. Um, bicycle riding, you know, in terms of activity, especially on narrow, really rigid bicycle seats. You know, if you're sitting on those for a long time, that's actually going to be compressing where that pedendal nerve exits through Alcox Canal in your groin. And so cyclists, a lot of times, and this goes for, you know, people of all, um, you know, genders, pronouns, like if, if you're riding a bicycle, you can have pedendal neuropathy in your kind of, you know, perineal and genital area. Um, also, things that can cause it even going back up, spinal, you know, trauma, spinal dysfunction. I remember one time I had a patient who was a cheerleader that when she was younger, you know, she was dropped and she hurt her tailbone. And, you know, now 20 years later, she's just been having kind of this progressive discomfort over and over and over. And it's been getting worse and worse. And we go and lo and behold, she actually has pedendal neuropathy because she has had trauma to her, um, you know, coccyx and to her sacrum there. Um, sometimes we'll find patients that have little cysts in the sacrum, uh, specifically something called a Tarlov cyst. That can cause pedendal neuropathy. And um, so really with this, the, the take home as far as diagnosing it is A, kind of identifying what's going on, but then really finding where in the course of the nerve the dysfunction is so you can appropriately treat it. So that kind of is a good segue into treatment. So what do we do about it? Let's say you come in, you say, aha, this is pedendal neuropathy. I know what this is. Well, what do you do? So once again, got to figure out what the, the cause is. If there is a muscle issue, then you want to work with the muscles, right? So if there's spasmed muscles or if there's really hypotonic or kind of loose muscles, pelvic floor physical therapy is a fantastic, um, you know, treatment for patients with pedendal neuropathy. Um, and, and kind of using adjuncts with that, whether that's, you know, using something like a TheraWand, um, sometimes we'll give intravaginal muscle relaxers, um, you know, and, and I want to kind of settle on that for a second. I'll, I'll see patients sometimes that come in and say, well, I tried vaginal Valium. It didn't do anything. Well, tell me about when you took it. Well, I only took it on demand. Well, nope, not going to do anything. I'm going to tell you right now that that's not going to do a single thing at all. Um, the thing with vaginal Valium, unlike oral Valium, is that if you take a Valium pill by mouth, it's going to get quickly disseminated into your bloodstream and part of that's going to go up and cross through the blood brain barrier and that's why you can get some kind of drowsiness and things like that from that medication and it works very quickly as a muscle relaxer oral volume doesn't really help a whole bunch honestly i mean yeah you're gonna get some but it's not really gonna be that great vaginal valium you have it's a dose dependent result or dose dependent like you you have to kind of continually use it over and over and over like you're not it's not a good treatment for an, as as an ad needed or a prn basis so when i do vaginal valium trials on patients i'll give 10 milligrams of valium vaginally every eight hours for three days in a row so they're just doing that whether they're hurting or not and the goal is by that third day at the end of that third day, I would like around a 50% reduction in their discomfort. And if that's the case, I know that their pain is muscle, like musculoskeletal related, specifically like spasmed muscles in the pelvis. And knowing that in connection with pelvic floor physical therapy, uh, some of the findings there can allow me to titrate treatments, to, you know, better. Um, and if they respond well to Valium, you know what else they're going to respond to? Botox. And so that's one of the things I love to do is go in and Botox those pelvic floor muscles. And that gives patients 90 days on average worth of relief, sometimes more. 
um, and it's a fantastic option for them. Um, other things, now if they say, well, I don't want Botox, but the Valium helped, muscle relaxers, um, oral ones can be really good. And I'm not talking about Flexoril or Psychobenzaprine, that's not really what we're working on here. Um, we wanna look at something like Robaxin, or it's Methacarbonol, um, or Tizanidine, or one of the things that actually works as a muscle relaxer. Flexoril, or Cyclobenzaprine, is a CNS depressant, actually. Um, and it makes you just kind of, woo, you know, loosey-goosey. And the thought is, if you are really tense, and, you know, anxious about things, and you're, you know, worried, then your muscles are gonna be tightened. So if we relax your brain, the muscles relax on their own. The methocarbonol or the, like I said, the robaxin actually works on the muscle fibers itself. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a good choice. So, um, otherwise, you know, something else that we'll do too, um, as kind of a diagnostic and a therapeutic test is do what's called a pedendal nerve block. That is an injection usually of um, numbing medication at the one of the pedendal nerve kind of roots, whether that's intravaginally or you can do it transgluteally, like going through the, the buttock there to try and get to that same spot where that nerve really will branch out. Um, and this, you know, depending on the type of medication that you use can provide short term relief, like a couple of hours and can be diagnostic to say, yep, this is pedendal neuropathy. Or there are some cases in which we'll add like a steroid if we think there's a pedendal neuritis, which is an inflammation of that nerve there. Or um, I do pedendal nerve blocks for it, pretty much any time I do vaginal surgeries on patients, or excuse me, vulvar surgeries on them. Like if I had to do a vulvar vestibulectomy, or I was doing you know a lot of like a labiaplasty or cosmetic stuff, we're gonna give them a pedendal nerve block so that they have good pain control afterwards. Um, and off-label, we can use medications like um, Expiril, which is a liposomal lidocaine. It lasts for three days. So that's a really good, you know, post-surgical block for patients, definitely. Um, so other things kind of moving up that track, you know, if you find that there's spinal trauma or has been spinal issues, um, getting in with, once again, a physical therapist, you know, if it's a musculoskeletal issue with the spine or sacrum, or, you know, even talking to a spine surgeon. If you have like one of those Tarlov cysts or one of those actual functional cysts on the sacrum that may be causing issues, you know, surgical removal may provide you with lots of, of improvement. You can also do pedendal nerve blocks through the spine. Now you'd see kind of a, a, a pain specialist for that. They do those under fluoroscopy and they go kind of and get the, the nerve conjoining um, transforaminally through the little holes in the sacrum there. So. So there are definitely options for that. Now, some people say, hey, I don't want any procedures. Is there just other medication I can take? Um, yes, there's definitely um, medications to help with nerve pain, old school gabapentin um, or Neurontin, uh, Lyrica, Lyrica or Pregabalin. Those are both really useful. Um, amitriptyline, um, it, it's kind of got an interesting history. And really studies have shown it doesn't do a whole lot yet People still throw amitriptyline at nerve pain. Um, so it's another kind of one to kind of consider. Um, outside of kind of normal FDA approved medications, low dose naltrexone, you know, you hear me talk about it quite a bit on here, kind of generalized anti-inflammatory for endocrine and, and nerve related structures. You know, some patients respond really well to that too. So there's a lot here and I haven't, this is just kind of touching the surface. Um, a special patient kind of group I didn't talk about in the, my stories, but I'll probably talk about in the future, is patients who have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome or EDS and how that connective tissue disorder may cause them to be more at risk for developing the pedendal neuralgia there. So anyway, that's, that's really about it here for this topic. Obviously, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, you know, feel free to share this video. If you have pedendal neuropathy and, you know, you're looking for someone to, to help you with, with treat that or go on that healthcare journey, by all means, reach out, um, you know, check me out at, at www.havencenter.com. Um, and let's work together to help you kind of, you know, get through this and, and get on with living your best life. So anyway, have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll talk to you later.